Thanks, Rachel. Hello, Phil Lisbon. Thanks for having me here today. I am super excited to dive into our company's signature product, Web3 Storage, um, and how it can unlock the data layer for developers, end users, and everyone in between. My name is David. I'm the CEO of Daghouse, a company that is uh, incubated within Protocol Labs and still soon will be spinning out into its own independent startup in the near future. Daghouse builds the Web3 storage platform, NFT storage on top of it, and Elastic IPFS, a cloud-native implementation of IPFS. In the next 15 minutes, we'll dive into the Web3 storage platform, starting with an overview of the product itself, then a double click into the underlying architecture and what it enables, and then a glimpse into the future uh, that our users can look forward to as we continue to mature the product. Uh, my colleague Chris was on stage yesterday discussing a new API that uh, is currently in beta called W3Up, and we'll definitely touch on that, but this will be a more general overview of the platform. So, oops. Let's, uh, let's start with the product then um, and what it's solving. So the Web3 storage platform is solving a problem that we're all pretty familiar with today. Traditional cloud services are incentivized and designed to lock you in, and really what this does is undermine the potential of applications to truly solve user needs. Breaking this apart a little bit, uh, it really stems from these data and identity silos that we see in practice in modern application infrastructure. Um, and these silos especially apply to cloud services. Uh, they're incentivized to minimize things like interoperability and portability uh, because this means that they don't end up having to compete in a lot of ways. They don't have to compete on innovation or efficiency and in many times not even cost. Um, and what this ends up doing is constraining the potential of applications and web experiences in general. The solution? Web3 Storage. Uh, it's a platform that is designed to unlock the data layer for developers and end users, uh, making it possible to decouple how they interact with their data and where it's actually physically being stored for whatever their production use case might be. And our users love the Web3 Storage platform because it ends up breaking down these data and identity silos that we just talked about. Um, it does this by uh, using decentralized protocols and implementing them alongside uh, bringing to the forefront a lot of usability elements. Um, you know, the, the platform is super reliable and performant and easy to use. And by unlocking the data layer, what ends up happening is our users can implement any application architecture they can dream of. And when we talk about Web3 Storage being a, a platform, it's because it consists of a number of complementary products uh, across storage, uh, content delivery through our HTTP gateway, um, and naming as well. And across each of these products, this theme of bringing decentralized protocols and combining with usability holds true. Uh, talking a little bit about adoption of some of these specific products, um, love to tell you that Web3 Storage as a platform has grown a ton in the last year. Uh, we're now making over 170 million uploads available to the IPFS network and stored in Filecoin deals. And most of this growth has come from the NFT storage space or the NFT space through a product we run called NFT.Storage. You can think of that as a user of Web3 Storage built on top of the Web3 Storage platform, as well as a lot of NFT creators and marketplaces storing directly on Web3 Storage's platform. Um, however, more recently, growth continues to accelerate through other areas. We're seeing an increasing number of things like uh, generative AI art being stored, uh, a lot of uh, projects indexing different blockchains and the IPFS network and that sort of thing. Some quick screenshots of our product today. So on the left, uh, it shows uh, the pricing model we have. Uh, prices can range from eight to 10 cents per Gibby byte stored per month. Uh, it can be even less depending on your use case, how much you're reading the data, how many blocks are um, in your data. Um, and it's really easy to use. You can store data in two lines of code. Data is, uh, once uploaded, immediately available in our IPFS gateway, um, and then a few seconds later available over public IPFS. And from there, it usually takes around one to three days for the data to be in a Filecoin deal, um, and it's stored in multiple uh, storage providers. And once it's in there, you can, of course, check the Filecoin chain for deal information, but you can also ping our API directly to get that info. I'll talk quickly about another product that we launched this year uh, called W3Link. This is our HTTP gateway that we launched in March. 
And already since then, we're serving over 1 billion requests weekly. And to put that number into context, uh, that's just about the same amount that the IPFS.io uh, public gateway that Protocol Labs runs serves. Um, and you know, it's bringing performance and reliability to the forefront from the read side of IPFS as well. Um, the growth has come from users like Magic Eden uh, magnifying the actual usage from end users of this product. For instance, in the Magic Eden case, they serve NFTs minted through their programs, their Launchpad program, uh, in their website via W3Link. All right, so that was a quick overview of the product and the platform itself. Let's dive a little bit into the architecture. So I might have beaten you over the head about it by now, but as you've seen, one of the big differentiators of Web3 storage is its usage of decentralized protocols. And this buckets into two broad categories. The first is decentralized data protocols. And this decentralizes how the data is physically stored as well as how the data is referenced and accessed. Um, and then these are protocols we're actively using in the product today. In the next quarter or so, we'll also start incorporating uh, decentralized identity and auth protocols. Um, and these will be used for our permissioned APIs. For instance, the new upload API W3Up that I mentioned, and Chris talked about yesterday. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, check out that talk once it's posted online. Taking through each one of these protocols on the data side, many of you are already familiar with IPFS. It makes data available via a content address, regardless of whether, where the data is. Um, so de developers can reference data in their apps independently of where it's stored or how it's moved around. And then Filecoin, uh, on top of that, gives some guarantees of the actual physical storage of the data um, using uh, cryptographic proofs and in uh, economic incentives. Uh, the data is physically being stored as promised. And then on the auth side, uh, decentralized identifiers uh, that we're plugging into allow for any actor to be represented by a key pair. Uh, and then plugging into this is uh, something kind of hot off the presses called UCANs. Uh, UCANs are an auth token spec that's, that was authored and being driven forward by the Fission team. Um, and uh, this allows DIDs in the context of our service um, to invoke API calls by simply signing that UCAN with their keys. Uh, so what this means in practice is that uh, we, as a service, can plug into an existing network of identities uh, without a central source of truth governing um, those identities like a Google single sign-on. And then equally as cool, and I'll talk about this more in a bit, but permissions can be delegated from uh, someone who has a Web3 storage account to other actors like um, the developer's users. Um, and that can let them interact with uh, our permission to APIs without uh, a middleman there. So how are these protocols actually implemented in our architecture? Uh, we'll start on the upload side of things today. Uh, so starting on the left, you have a user. They're looking to upload their data. They'll um, create a, uh, they'll encode that data into an IPFS DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Um, that's where the name DAG house comes from. Um, and uh, this ends up generating the content identifier on the client side. Um, why is it important for that hash of the data, that CID, to be uh, generated on the client side? It really keeps things trustless. Um, so rather than sending data over and trusting the CID that comes back, you do that all on the client side. Um, a car file that contains that graph is then sent to Web3 Storage, today using a traditional bearer token. And then from there, uh, the data is stored in three physical places. Um, so it's stored in cloud buckets in our Elastic IPFS instance, it's stored in cloud buckets with W3Link, our gateway, and then in multiple Filecoin deals as well. And you might be asking, why store it in three different places? Why not save some money or pass some uh, savings onto the users for lower prices? Well, each copy of the data serves a different purpose. So the data that's in our hosted Elastic IPFS instance, it allows that data to be available over the public IPFS network via BitSwap, um, the, the transport that the public IPFS use, network uses. Um, it's in W3Link because uh, users want fast and reliable access to that data through an HTTP endpoint right away as soon as that upload hits our service, and that's what that provides. Um, and then it's stored in Filecoin deals as well, because a lot of users want that verifiability that we're truly storing the data as promised. And then soon, um, as you've heard a lot over the last two days, there's a lot of cool things coming to the Filecoin network, like the Filecoin virtual machine, and it allows you to, to plug into that entire ecosystem as well. And I would be remiss not to talk a little bit more about Elastic IPFS, because um, it's literally netted me maybe like 
two extra hours of sleep a night. Um, but uh, as our service was growing, uh, we had previously been running Kubo nodes as our IPFS infrastructure. And at a certain level of scale, uh, we were having difficulty uh, pr providing performance and reliability to users. Uh, so we ended up writing a cloud-native implementation of IPFS, Elastic IPFS. And you can see in the graph behind me uh, the impact of it on something like upload latency to the user. Uh, so it was all over the place before. We were seeing all other sorts of things, like 500 errors delivered to the user. Um, and as soon as Elastic IPFS was deployed, all of this went away. And my colleague Alan at IPFS camp a few days ago, uh, I, I saw actually his talk um, is posted online now, so go check that out. Um, he talked about this. It's called 5 billion blocks. And that's the number of blocks via the CIDs that we're broadcasting to the network today. And from the point that we uh, deployed Elastic IPFS to this 5 billion point, we haven't seen a blip in, in performance and reliability. Um, it's also worth noting, though, as things like Filecoin retrieval improves, uh, this load to broadcast the network will start to be distributed across uh, more nodes out there. It's just nice to know that we can uh, rely on something like this as we scale in the future. And then, uh, as mentioned, we do have a new API that incorporates UCANs uh, to the upload flow that's uh, now in beta. Um, so by using UCAN auth instead of traditional bearer tokens, uh, we can plug into the DID universe without needing to trust any one entity for auth. But just as cool, um, you can have more serverless data pipelines. So a Web3 storage user can delegate uh, the ability to upload on behalf of that user um, without needing to spin up something like a proxy server simply to um, be able to grab the, uh, the secret token needed to store with Web3 storage. Instead, they can just send a token to whoever their user is, and their user can store um, directly with Web3 storage. I guess I just said that this was, that last part was the even more interesting part, but potentially even more interesting than that is the possibility of a user actually bringing their own Web3 storage account to the table. So um, you can still have this client server traditional model, a maybe more serverless version of it, um, where the application developer is paying for an account to store on the user's behalf. But potentially, uh, as a developer, you want, might want to offload that responsibility completely. Um, so your user can have its own Web3 storage account it's bringing to the table, or it can be a programmatically generated one. But um, you know, users might want to come with their own cryptographic identity, or they might want to have control over their own data. And because an application is writing against IPFS content IDs, nothing to do with where the data sit, um, the application itself can be agnostic uh, to whether the data is local or whether it's stored on Web3 storage. And it absolves the application developer from having to worry about this potentially sensitive area. Um, and then developers end up having lower startup and overhead costs as a result as well. Um, so if you're a developer and that sounds good to you, um, this is something that you should totally check out. So we've invested in these uh, building blocks, these decentralized protocols, not just because of what it provides us today, but what it will provide us in the future. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the things we're looking forward to. One area is commoditizing cloud storage. Uh, so you just saw that IPFS and UCANs reduces the leverage and lock-in uh, that cloud providers have over their users. Um, and if you think about it, it's kind of crazy that, you know, this lock-in world exists. Hardware prices are commoditized, yet cloud providers are um, enjoying fat margins while making, forcing their users to stick around with them, even if it's not the best service for them. Um, so what we can do, what we can bring to the table, is give users the choice of where they're actually physically storing their data and allow them to pay only for what they consume. So you can end up utilizing the best physical storage for your use case, depending on what, what you and your users need in terms of performance or cost or other things. Um, and in particular, what this does is bring very cheap Filecoin storage at the forefront of disruption. So all of a sudden, if you're a cloud storage provider, you're forced to compete head on uh, with what Filecoin brings to the table, uh, as long as that's enough for you. Um, so you can uh, think of us in maturity as looking more and more like a marketplace. It's like how Airbnb with a single pane um, allowed you to look at all the options of short-term rentals in an area. You can do the same with cloud storage without um, that friction existing. 
The adoption of end user identity interfaces and products also is a big part of uh, our future growth story. As that tide rises, we rise with it, regardless of whatever um, you know, end user identity products end up winning. Uh, because you can build on top of simply key pairs. Um, so uh, you know, if crypto wallets really takes off or things like Apple Passkey, um, we can plug into all these different ecosystems and then really build features taking advantage of uh, the power of uh, user self-sovereignty. So uh, one crazy example is, hey, let's allow our users to crowdfund other users' accounts. So if you're a DAO and it's important to you to preserve a set of data, you can have a DID associated with a Web3 storage account, and other end users with uh, identities can then crowdfund that account to make sure that data sticks around. And then finally, this is fairly early thinking, um, but in the same way we can function as a UX marketplace layer on top of uh, physical cloud storage providers, we can do the same uh, for services running compute over that data, provi providing a similar ease of use. Um, so it's important to consider where the data is stored and where the compute's running on top of it in the same kind of sentence, uh, because you know, things like cost and uh, bandwidth matter, uh, but at the same time, you don't want users to feel locked in uh, to their cloud providers as a result. Uh, so you can see uh, cool decentralized compute projects like the Filecoin Virtual Machine and Bacalao take off, um, and we want to be uh, that marketplace, that UX layer, that allows them to compete super head-on with existing cloud compute providers. So to recap. Awesome decentralized protocols and their underlying tech have existed for a while, but what our platform does is make them broadly usable for developers, businesses, and users. And our users love how we provide ease of use, performance, and reliability while maintaining openness, portability, and verifiability. And there's a ton of exciting disruption that will come as a result. We'd love if you could stay in contact with us. Uh, join us on IPFS Discord or Filecoin Slack. Uh, we have a channel there. Um, also, check out our GitHub to see the code of pretty much everything I talked about today. It's all open source. And we do have a booth back here at Phil Lisbon if you want to swing by and say hi. Uh, so thanks a lot for your time. Thanks to the foundation for letting us speak today, and appreciate it.